this week's edition of Impact. I've got an awesome guest this week, uh, Rebecca Muser. Rebecca is a good friend of mine who is truly changing the world, has actually made a, an impact within an entire society and culture uh, through a case that many of you watching around now are very aware of the case when we bring it up and maybe not be aware of some of the people who came forward, the witnesses, in this case the witness who wore red, who had such an incredible impact on bringing somebody to justice and potentially giving more people freedom through doing that. That's Rebecca. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mike. Always a pleasure to talk with you and your crew. Well, one of the cool things is, is we just got off the show Gift of Respect, and anytime I get to have a friend on, it's especially more fun and exciting because we, we have such a background and know each other so well. I, I'd rather have you tell the world your story than me because it's more authentic for you. So I'm going to let you, Rebecca, give us a short synopsis of what brought you all the way to us here today, the journey that brought you here, to us. Thanks. Well, first I, I want to say a special thanks to you, Mike, for the opportunity to be with you. I, I was so impacted when I first met Mike and your passion for teaching the skills that are so desperately needed. So, you know, again, I just feel really honored to be here and share this conversation with you. I do come from a very different background than most, although with my story and as I share it, I invite you to understand that we're not that different. The details are different, but the life lessons are very much the same, so it's really cool that we can share this time. I was born and raised in the FLDS cult. My mother was my father's second wife, and we were polygamous within a cult group in Salt Lake City, Utah, here in the heart of the United States. And life for me growing up was I was my father's secret along with my 14 siblings from his second wife. And I was trained in the religious school. Actually, Warren Jeffs was my school principal. And I went through years and years of this religious training. And all of our schooling and understanding was funneled through that. And so I grew up with this very limited, twisted view of life and the perceptions of life and also what my obligations were as a daughter in order to go to heaven, what I had to do, and absolute obedience was what was required in order to be approved of by God or to even go to heaven. Anything other than that was damnation. So at age 19, I was forced into a polygamous marriage to Warren Jeff's father, his 85-year-old prophet, and I was his 19th wife. Over the course of seven years, he went on to have 46 more wives after me. There were a total of 65 wives, and at age 92, Roland Jeffs died. And at that point, after all that I had experienced, after I had seen behind the scenes of what was going on really in the FLDS leadership, I could not stomach the fact that there could be anything really divine or holy left in that. And I just figured if that's heaven, I will gladly take hell. I'll burn, but that's better than having to live here. And I figured that maybe God would have more mercy on my soul if I was honest about how I felt as opposed to going into another marriage. The last words that Warren Jeff spoke to me before I went into a courtroom, he pointed his finger at me and he said, I will break you and I will train you to be a good wife. And that was the last straw. I left a note on my bed and I was fortunate to be able to escape and get to where my brother was living on the coast of Oregon. And once they found out I was gone, they were combing the neighboring towns looking for me. And after I left, I really came to the point where, as I learned more about the outside world, I learned what, what respect was, the beginnings of that. I realized the depth of the atrocities going on within the group and the abuses that were going on. You know, I had very uh, young sisters who were, one of them had been forced to marry at 14. And so I had two other baby sisters who I knew my mother could not protect. And being one of the prophet's wives, I was in a unique position because of what I'd seen and what I saw. It was important, terrifying, grueling, and not convenient. But it's important to, I think, for anybody who has faced these kinds of things where shame or secrets are, are important, you have to break that silence in order to stop the abuse. And so I did go on to be part of the investigations, part of the prosecution team. And um, over the co course of six years, being in and out of the courtroom, being the lead prosecuting witness to bring some of these leaders to justice, 
and I, I, it was quite a journey for me. It brought me face to face with my past that I desperately wanted to forget. And as as that age old lesson is, sometimes the most terrifying thing that we have to face is really the gift to that healing. And that's how. And, I'm yeah, and thank you for sharing. And your story has so many levels to it, uh, and so many layers to it that is truly. As people learn more about you, they realize how incredible you are. And the neat thing about you, Rebecca, is you share, well, everybody has that incredibleness in them. It's helping them realize that to bring it forward, which is so true and so wonderful. You right now are wearing a certain color under the under the vest there. That is an important, <laughs> yeah. that is an important color to you. I know the color is important to you. Obviously, the title of the book is A Witness or a Red. But I want you to share why the color is important to you and, and how you use that color as inspiration and strength. Well, I think along the way in my journey, a lot of people think, oh, I want to do great big things in this world. And what they don't realize is that I did not set out to do great big things. When I started testifying or I started to even contemplate standing, standing up, it wasn't because one day I was going to write a book and I was going to lead a movement of freedom. It was doing the dirty work that needed to be done. And along that way in the dirty work, all of us have to have these reminders because we're human. It's hard. And we have to have these little things that show us and remind us to, to take courage, to stand up, take another step. For me, we were not allowed to wear the color red. The first time that I wore red in the courtroom was after I saw Warren Jeffs, or when I saw him, after he told me he would break me. I wanted to send a message to him that I was not broken. And being banned from wearing the color red, being the prophet's wife and sitting in a courtroom, speaking out against him, would have, by FLDS standards, given God license to just strike me down with lightning and fry me right there. And so in, in the beginning, it was out of defiance. I just wanted to tell him I was not broken. But what I've come to learn is that I climbed a fence in 2002 to escape to get to freedom. And in the 11 years since, just like everybody else, I have to climb those fences. Red to me is a reminder of courage, of freedom, that I have to choose and I have to act on that today. So I actually wear red a lot. Uh, even people in my, my everyday life, they're like, you always have red. And, and it's, it's that little thing for me that just reminds me I have to choose today, just like everybody else. If you weren't wearing red, I think I would be more taken back by that than noticing you were wearing red. So, But, I mean, that's great because, you know, here's the thing about, like, your red. You know, when you think of companies, they have their brand, right? And why? Because it reminds people of what it means to be associated with them. And your red is the strength and the courage. And I think it's great for me listening to this to think of, is there something simple like that I can do in my life? It gives me a reminder and inspiration, and the cool thing is you're consistent about it. It's not like you just do it every now and then. You're extremely consistent, so that strength is always there. That reminder of that strength is always there right in, in front of you. How did you, Rebecca, you, your journey, like you said, you didn't plan on writing a book. You didn't go into this thinking, uh, I'm going to do the, do the, be a witness and then become a celebrity. That, that wasn't your intention whatsoever. And in fact, being a witness was scary. So I don't think maybe all of our viewers right now understand just how scary, truly scary, the concept was of you being a witness. So can you give a little insight there on, on what, that, what that involved? Yeah, there were two worlds of this. You know, when Warren Jeffs was apprehended, my mother, who I hadn't heard from in years, called me and she said, I would rather see every one of my 14 children dead and laid in the grave than to see any one of you stand up against our prophet and our priesthood. Just because you leave something doesn't mean you don't care about the people. It was, it was very hard to go up against everything else I'd ever understood or ever known internally, but then there's also the physical side. I was not just going up against one man or a group of men. I was going up against an entire church who uses all of these tactics for all of these years to keep women in place, to keep them silent and in check. So it was uncomfortable for all of my life conditioning. It was uncomfortable for everything I understood. And it was also a physical threat. I do, and I have ever since I began testifying, I do receive threats from people inside the FLDS and people outside of the FLDS. And there's a very real cost of, of speaking out. And along the way, oh my gosh, 
uh, I came face to face with some of the most intense attorneys, the highest paid attorneys in this nation trying to get this church off and being a single mom literally feeling like I was fighting for my life and yet it wasn't for me I was speaking out and this is the strength of truth for anybody as grueling as hard as it was I think that when you're standing on truth you can go up against even the most insurmountable odds and and come through it it takes dedication and two I would just add this in, if anybody is going against anything like this and even just in daily life, learning the skills of self-care because you can sacrifice. I think people are genuinely good and we, we wish people good will and we want to serve. But in our service, there's nothing holy about driving ourselves into the ground and I had to really learn come face to face with that aspect as well. You can't give what you don't have. So when you are pushed into a situation where you are going to have to give a lot, be very, very aware about your own person and where your strength is, where's your energy level. That's I just want to throw that out there because I wish I would have thought about that sooner in that journey of getting through all of the trials. Well, and you've come out such a strong individual. It's anybody watching right now can see the energy that just flows from you. It's When I first met you, it was evident. Uh, and For those watching, Rebecca and I have known each other for a couple of years now. We met at an event several years ago, really connected, uh, both her and her co-author, my good friend and I. We just we hung out a lot. And then we got to spend time each, with each other again later, uh, almost just a few months after that. And it was great. My wife got to get to know you and just loves you too. Uh, and so you're such a dynamic person. How did you get from being the witness who wore red to the book, The Witness Who Wore Red. Well, the more that I was in trial, when I very first testified, I had no intention of writing a book. And as the years go by, and I would go into the courtroom, and I would see what was going on, and the reasons that were given to allow these atrocities, I realized that nobody from the inside was giving an authentic view of how the grooming happens and I have a young daughter she's six years old and I can't imagine you know not everybody's gonna have to marry someone like Warren Jeffs or his father but but I want my daughter and I want other boys and girls to learn the skills of respect and to understand what is abuse because I think it's very apparent domestic violence, abusive relationships, as you know in the work that you do, it is so rampant and it's so important and it's skill sets that really protect our kids. We can't do that all the time. So that was my reasoning in, in writing my book. I wanted to share what happened because if we don't take note, it can happen again and again and again and again and so many atrocities so much harm is done, so much trauma is, has happened that's needless and it could have been avoided. So when I began writing my book, I had no idea. I was accustomed to answering questions in a courtroom, but nobody had said, hey, Rebecca, how did that feel when you went through this? And I was shocked at the anger, the emotions, not just anger, but loss, betrayal. There was a whole wave of this that came through as I started to really feel what happened, not just talk about the facts that happened. So don't be surprised for anybody out there. I think it's important whether you publish your book or not, do write it. And it's it can be an incredible gift, hard, but a beautiful gift in that healing process. And going through the writing process with my book, I really discovered and gained the courage to no longer deny it. so so long I had just wanted to put it back here and just think no let's just pretend that didn't happen even though I was answering factual questions about it and going through the writing process I was surprised at how much anger I felt and how many unprocessed situations that that I that I had I mean wow it was it was intense at times and I'm so grateful for that process. The writing process of my book was almost three years and I really needed that time because I dove in head first to parts of my life that I had never revisited and uh, it was very raw 
very vulnerable and it was kind of scary to be so honest about my weakness and my fear but I, I invite anyone with that courage and to, to learn that grace the healing part of it it doesn't happen without facing that but the beauty on the other side is is definitely worth it and you do it at such an authentic level it, you can tell anybody watching this right now who then goes and reads your book is going to hear your voice in the book because you are you and it's the reason your journey and who you are as a person and the way you share so openly honestly for anybody who's not aware we're talking about a New York Times bestseller both in print and ebook uh, incredible success and just anybody watching it's the witness who wore red and you can find it in any bookstore any online bookstore it is everywhere it is doing so well having such a huge impact What's next, Rebecca? What's the next thing? What are ways you're trying to make an impact in the world today? What's been your journey? For instance, speaking out, what's been your journey along that path? Well, I am most excited about this part because there's so many life lessons in the writing of my book in my life. I am not unique. I am just like everybody else. And it's just been a process of doing the right thing and, and as hard as it was. So the lessons there are what I'm most excited to talk about. It's it's not just me. This is everybody that's dealing with these things. So what's next for me is I have a foundation, claimred.org, and I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to be working with some of the leading psychologists in the nation on trauma to develop skill sets, to develop better ways for everybody to handle PTSD, trauma, and that is very dear to my heart because we, we have our life and that is such a gift but how we're living our daily life really depends on our skills to be able to handle what's going on so that is one of my biggest passions is working with my foundation not just for people from the FLDS but for people of any kind of forced labor forced sex any kind of that trauma to give them skills and then I'm thrilled to be speaking I spoke so long in the courtroom and you have to be so careful you can't speak openly or connect with people you just have to answer what you're asked and there's some really golden nuggets for all of us that we can all come together on uh, I will be working with women's groups and teaching the skills some of these lessons and also learning from other people like you Mike that are, are teaching these skills for our youth because they are the ones to focus on uh, to give them the skills to spare them of the pain that we as parents have gone through and, and I'm just really excited about that part well, you're so powerful. Your presence, for those of us who have been blessed to get to see you speak, moving, inspirational, you touch people's lives, you make people think, and that's the opportunity then for change to occur because you also then deliver the skill sets, as you mentioned, which is so powerful. So I want to make sure everybody knows how to get a hold of you because you want to bring Rebecca to speak, and you do want to bring Rebecca to speak. That's just my recommendation. I'm not making anybody, but we want to highly recommend it. You want to go to RebeccaMuser.com, which is R-E-B-E-C-C-A-M-U-S-S-E-R.com. Uh, now, you also said Claim Red. Is Claim Red, ClaimRed.org, Rebecca? Yes, ClaimRed.org, and you can go check it out. We've got some really exciting things that we're launching this year that we'll be posting on Facebook and on all of our social media. We'd love to welcome anyone to come and join. I think that if we all come together and link arms, we can create this massive wave of change that this world so desperately needs. And you have some really powerful experiences you share. For instance, you've been back in the community, correct? Yes, I have. What, what was that like to go back in? Going back to the, the compound where I lived after years. I had not been there in eight years. and It was tender. I, was not, I didn't realize that there would be so much emotion. And it was liberating as well. And, and I remember driving out there and just seeing the mountains. I felt my heartbeat starting to race. And I thought, uh, and I felt kind of that same fear of having to fight so hard for my independence and walking up to the very wall that I climbed over and realizing the evidence that that abuse is still going on and yet freedom is still possible it was extremely humbling and I feel so blessed that I would I have been able to taste and experience both sides for me with my FLDS life, it's like dying and then being able to live again. Only you remember your past lifetime. So everything I value uh, 
because of my past, knowing not not having freedom, and I remember reaching up and touching the wall, and realizing in this this most delicious moment that they could not have me back, and that wall that had once been my prison, and being able to stand there and hold my sense of identity, my own independence, it was like confirmation that healing absolutely is possible and it was actually quite thrilling yeah and as you say everybody has a wall right your wall some people will hear your story and go I don't have a wall like that but we have a wall we have a wall and so the great thing about your book is it helps everybody look at what is the wall I'm climbing what is the journey I'm climbing and how this applies to me and my life and it's one of the great things about your message when you speak, when you share, is that concept that we're all along some journey, uh, some journey to freedom. And what's been your greatest moment of freedom? You know, you look back over the years, what's, what are a few moments you've had? It doesn't have to be one, but where you just go, wow. Um, you know, I think one of the most iconic moments of my journey from leaving the FLDS was when I was on the YFC ranch, brought in to work with law enforcement. There was so much pressure and so much going on, and I was just being hammered with all of these questions. But then internally, I was surrounded in the buildings. It looked, it smelled, it felt so much like the home that I had escaped from. And so it brought up all of that inside me. So I had these two worlds just like clashing. And I remember one of the rangers, he said, I need you to come with me. And we were walking over to the temple to walk in. And I knew it was very serious. And, uh, and dealing with this, this moment of knowing that my words would have such massive impact on people I really loved. So we were walking over to the temple. And just unconsciously, I stepped in line behind this ranger and was walking behind him just as I had been trained to my whole FLDS life and he stopped and he turned around and he said are you okay and I said oh yeah I'm okay I didn't even, didn't even register and I come up and I was right alongside him and I started walking again and then I slipped in step behind him again and without even realizing it and then the ranger said ma'am am I walking too fast for you and it hit me in that moment that was the first time in my whole life that I had been treated as an equal not just words but felt the behavior of being a woman being treated as an equal not because they needed my help but because I was another human being and that hit me and I it changed me forever on that and I, I really treasure that experience that is powerful, and thank you so much for sharing that, Rebecca. Everybody out there, go out there and get your copy. The Witness War Red, it's going to move you, it's going to inspire you, you're going to want to share it with everybody, and you're going to get to see even so much more. I mean, we're just hitting the tip, tiny tip of the iceberg here with Rebecca. It's going to give you so much more, and you're going to want to share the stories and the lessons throughout your life. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us here today. Thank you so much, Mike. Always a delight to see you. Well, you know, you and I will be talking. For everybody else out there watching, thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Impact. Next week, check in. We'll always have a, one of the, like, a great episode on a holiday. We'll replay that for you to be able to join every Thursday, 12.35 p.m. Central, 1.35 p.m. Eastern, 10.35 a.m. Pacific. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Impact.